of this week that I've preached uh, for 30 years on Thanksgiving. And so I, I, I look, you know, and you try to, you look through the scriptures and you think, okay, now what am I going to preach this year? And I thought, well, I could preach on the, uh, the nine, uh, the lepers, the ten lepers that were there and, and Jesus healed them and one came back and gave him thanks. And, and the scripture adds that little bit and he was a Samaritan. Now, my preaching has become very cultural in that I start looking back where the Middle East is, where Jesus was, because a lot of preachers in America kind of Americanize the Word of God when they're preaching. And so it just sounds like an American uh, theology. But I like to take it back to where it was. When Jesus said, uh, the one came back and gave thanks, he was a Samaritan, he was dealing with the racism of the day. And he was bringing out the fact that you guys consider. It is funny how that sickness, things bring us together. There were ten, and one was a Samaritan, which tells me the other nine were probably Jews. But though they had leprosy, it, it was a fellowship of pain. Everybody understand fellowship of pain? Whenever you've got a pain, somebody else got a pain, you hang out with people that are a pain. Y'all follow me? Amen. So these ten hung out together, and the one came back and gave thanks. And Jesus said, where are the other nine? He was a Samaritan. He was drawing attention to the fact that no matter where, what culture you're in, thanks is a powerful thing. And then, so I went to Psalm 100, and then I, again, thinking culturally, here is a king, King David. Now, I, I have family. I have friends. Uh, I was at a funeral of a friend yesterday. It was heartbreaking for me. He was 38 years old, and I was his pastor for a season in his family. And I, I, I have two churches that I'm honored to get to pastor and people. But I don't pastor a kingdom. David was over a kingdom. He had family. He had uh, warriors around him. And even with all the stress and all the things that he had to deal with at that moment, he wrote Psalm 100. In other words, he separated himself just for a moment from all the stresses of kingship and all the issues of life. And he said, you know what? I got to write something down. And he grabbed a quill and a piece of parchment, and he wrote, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. <sighs> Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. So he, he's proclaiming some things here. Amen. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. What a thought. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting. Uh, and that word loving kindness is the same word for mercy. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Now, I want you to look at me and listen to me just a minute. Because as David walked through this, so have I. And I've looked at some things. And again, I was telling Pastor Joseph, what I think I'll do is I'll look at a lot of the message I've done. And I'm going to pull the things that I really enjoy about Thanksgiving. And when David pulled this thing out of Psalm 100, he's saying a few things. He's laying this thing out. He says, shout joyfully to the Lord. Can I get a shout in the house? <laughs> you know, sometimes I was laughing at my pastor. We, we took him golfing with us. And uh, we used to, me, me, me and him used to golf all the time back in the day. And it had been 20 years since I golfed. Many of you know I've started back up again. And that's Pastor Joseph's fault. Hey, Amen. He's got me out there. But he would walk up to the golf ball and he would stare at it. And he'd go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he started shouting at the golf ball. <laughs> and I just asked him on the phone. I said, Pastor Mike, why was you shouting at the golf ball? He said, I was getting myself ready. And I thought, oh, that's good. And then I have found myself lately just shouting, except in the deer stand. I want to shout, but it didn't. Amen. But there's something about a shout. It just, it, it, some of you need to release yourself just a little bit. You just, you, uh, oh, the sour is just built up inside of you, and you just need to turn it loose. Whoa, oh, amen. Let a shout out. Amen. And when you shout, shout unto the Lord. He doesn't get nervous when you shout at him. Some churches I go in, are, everybody's quiet. Nobody's making any noise. 
and any, anything that falls over, it's just like, oh, you know, the dishes are broke. And it's just, it's funny. And I get into church, and I just want to shout. I did that on purpose, if you don't know. Uh, I just want to shout. And he says, shout unto the Lord. Shout to him. Because he doesn't get nervous. He doesn't get scared. Amen. You don't bother him. As a matter of fact, God ordained that shouts were given before victories. That you shouted before the victory. Not after the victory, but before. And some people, they just, they got to wait till they win. But I like to shout. One more time. Can I get a shout? Okay. Amen. There are times God does things about which you cannot be quiet. You got to say something. When, when my friend Josiah Ramirez killed his first deer last week, he could not be quiet. The text messages were coming in. It was just a little cold, ugly little deer, but it didn't matter. It meant something to him. And I thank God he got an ugly deer to start with. Amen. The verse 2 said, serve the Lord with gladness. Glad serving, not with, with sadness, but with gladness. Amen. Uh, it's a healthy sign of a grateful life is serving, serving one another. I, I watched a group of, 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 of men and women gathering into the kitchen this week over at the campus, and they were dividing up that, that wonderful barbecue to make sure that whoever purchased it last week would get it. And they were doing it with gladness. And I thought, none of them are getting paid, but someone, how, something's going on here that's going to matter there. They were serving the Lord with gladness. And that's what God has taught this church to do. We serve God by serving one another. You know, some people serve out of guilt. They do it to relieve the guilt in their life. You don't need to do that. Some do it to quiet their conscience so they got to serve. Some serve because they feel obligated or forced. Never want you to do that. I want you to serve the Lord with gladness. Can I get amen? Amen. The other command he gave us was come before him with joyful singing. Sing with joy. In a world full of pessimism, smile, shout, do something. Make your face indicate something that's going on in your heart because that's actually what's happening here. Dress up your testimony just a little bit. You know, you're supposed to be a believer in Christ. Dress it up some. Smile. You're going to heaven. No matter what hell you get on earth, you're going to heaven. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Verse 3 says, know that the Lord himself is God. This is so important. Know that God is God. There are three things. He says, know that the Lord is God. Acknowledge it. I know that he's God. Amen. Know that he made us. Accept the fact that God made you. I saw a meme this week that was hilarious. It was two snowmen standing together. And one snowman said to the other one, yeah, all these flakes just came to get, came down. and it, uh, All these snowflakes just came down and, and accumulated. And next thing you know, I was a snowman. That was supposed to be the way evolution works. How many know that a snowman didn't just happen? Somebody made it. Amen. We didn't just happen. God made us. Acknowledge that and accept it. And he says, know that we are his sheep. He has authority over us. We he is. Then he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Did you know I took that as a principle over 30 years ago and said that this church will first come in with praise. I've told every worship leader we've ever had, you come into this church, you're going to lead out with praise. That's why our first few songs are a little bit uplifted. And then all of a sudden we go into worship. Amen. This is our principle. This is what David taught us. And he's saying it into the kingdom courts there. Enter with thanksgiving, continue with praise. And then he said, give thanks to him. Make it personal. Remember, gratitude is rarer than faith. When that one came back, you remember I mentioned in the beginning, those 10 guys with leprosy, one came back. What was amazing about that was simply that gratitude is rarer than faith. So they had the faith to be healed. David, I remember you being in the hospital, pert near death. Do you remember that, sir? I hope you do. Because I'm sure I took a picture of you laying there, laying almost dead. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. Uh, I don't think I did. Uh, but I remember that. And a lot of us have faith to get healed. But then we forget to give God thanks. Right. Amen. So it's rare just to be appreciative for all the good things that's happened. And if you've served the Lord for years, sometimes you forget all the great things He's done in your life. That's why I go back and I reiterate it and I say it again and I mention it again and I say it to myself because I got to remember what God has done in my life. And then He says, and bless His name. Why? Because He is good. The word good there means pleasant, agreeable, delightful. Why, why is He so good? Because of His loving kindness. It endures forever. 
It's going to be here tomorrow. If tomorrow comes, his mercy will find me. Amen. And his faithfulness to all generations. When I see the word generation, I remind myself of my children and my children's children. That everybody here, one way or another, you probably have started a generation, whether a guardian or a parent or whatever, but you've got something going on and you want that faithfulness that God was in your life to pass on. Now, when I re read Philippians 4, 6, it was Paul that said to the Philippian church, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, amen, present your request to God. So in other words, when I come to God, I'm not, I'm not down, I'm not sad, with thanksgiving, I'm saying, God, I know you're going to answer this. I know you've got to answer for this. I don't have the answer. I know you can. And then it says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Do you realize there are times that you have peace and you don't understand why? I wrestle with it, man. I mean, I wrestle with it. There are times I have to fight for my peace. I fight to make things right. I stand in the middle of stuff all the time, and I say, God, help me. And then i got to remind myself, God, I can't do this on my own. You've got to give me peace. And God, it's just like it, it's downloaded into your spirit, amen, to give you peace, that everything is still going to be all right. Amen. And it will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. If there's one thing that we need right now is our minds right. You know, I know people that spend so much time taking care of their physical. They'll even read their Bible for their spirit. But our mind, our, this, your mind is your soul. I remember reading a scripture that says, what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And, and at the time, I thought that meant go to hell you know, because you had so much stuff. And then I reread it and realized the word soul had to do with my mind. See, when you get a whole lot of stuff, when you gain a whole lot of things, it affects your mind. And you want to hold on to it. That's why storage buildings are one of the greatest assets of Americans. Because we like to store up our stuff. Yes, somebody out there wants your old waffle maker. <laughs> Thanks is an attitude. Everybody say attitude. attitude. Man, I have found in life that the one thing I can control is my attitude. It's the only thing, actually, that I can control. You don't have to say thanks. You don't have to. But when I hear somebody say thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate you know, my family, my friends. I learned to use the word because I know the word opens doors. Thank you. I know the word without using it can close doors because it shows I wasn't appreciative. Amen. You are your attitude. Your attitude is you. I, I, when you walked in the door, I saw your attitude. It came right in with you. Amen. It, it either was smiling and was positive or it was down about something again this week. Amen. It's just something about attitude. Uh, attitude creates your world and designs your destiny. It determines your success or failure in any venture in life. It's more powerful than wealth. Attitude. It's more powerful than beauty or title or social status. It can make beauty ugly and homeliness attractive. It opens and closes them doors. The distinguishing factor between a winner and a loser is attitude. It's not the score. I've seen people lose games and it looked like they won it because their attitude was right. Amen. It's just that. And I've seen people win and they look like they lost because their attitude was wrong. Amen. Attitude, this distinguishing factor. What is attitude? It's the mindset that determines our interpretation and of the response to our environments. It's our way of thinking. Let me just tell you attitude does not determine what's going to happen on Thursday. I know it's Thanksgiving week. I understand that. But my attitude tells me every day for me to express myself, amen, and be thankful for the good things and the friends and the family I got. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I've often said that attitude determines your altitude. How high you fly will determine your attitude. It just all, it's all affected by that. And as I move through life, my attitude gets affected by my, by my health, by my wealth, by, by those around me, amen, it, it's, I'm affected by that. So I have to decide, okay, i got to deal with this attitude. And then there are times that your attitude affects my attitude. And I can't let your attitude change my good attitude. You can't let children, grandkids, folk around you, what's going on at work, amen, uh, Mr. And, and, and Mrs. Pessimistic, amen, that you work with, you can't let them change your attitude. Can I get an amen? amen? So you got to maintain a right attitude when the going gets tough. See, turbulence won't crash you. Wrong reactions do. There's always the turbulence in life. And this is one of the, I, 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 why are you preaching this? Because I need this. 
It ain't about you today. It's about me. I could turn this pulpit around, preach the rest of this message, <laughs> talk to myself, and y'all just get in on it. Amen. Listen, difficulties come when we internalize unfortunate circumstances, financial failure, grief, sickness. What really matters during rough times is what's happening in us, not to us. How is it affecting me? James says this. And my son asked me this week. He said, Dad, out of everything in life, what is the best thing that's ever happened to you? I said, a test. He said, what? He said, I said, a test. It was, it's been the test in my life that's made me who I am. Amen. Not the good things that just happen to happen. It's the test that I walked through that I passed that mattered. Count it all joy, my brother, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James is the guy that lost his head. And yet, thank God, he wrote some things before he did. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. My faith, your faith has to be tested. I got faith. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how you got faith. Wait till you go through a Harvey and a Melda. We'll see how you got faith. Wait till life starts flipping upside down. Wait till the loss of someone you love. We'll see how your faith is. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. See, you're not even mature and complete yet until you've gone through your test. Well, you've been through school, most of you. <clears throat> and when you do, you've got to take tests to get to the next grade. And every level is another devil. And as you move through life, the devils just seem to get more difficult. But if I whooped a seventh grade devil, and I did, in the gym, when he tore my shirt, when he pushed me from behind, he was a bully. And I got fed up with it. I'm not a fighter. I'm a skinny little seventh grader. But he pushed me, and I lost my mind. And I turned around, and I whooped that devil. And I put him on the ground. I straddled him. They had to pull me off of him. And after I whooped him, the bully in our, high, in our junior high school, every girl in that school whooped that boy. Because they figured if Hobart can whoop you, anybody can whoop you. And then I got to the eighth grade. Guess what? When I got to the eighth grade, the devil I dealt with in the seventh grade, I didn't have to deal with him no more because I'd already whooped him. Now, I say that in the physical, but in the spiritual, it's the same way. Every level is another devil. He said, you move up in life, you pass tests, you mature, you growing up. And that's what James is saying here. Amen. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking. Now, the Message Bible says it like this, and I love the way it says, consider the sheer gift. What? A gift? Friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, and you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. You never know people's true colors till they've gone through something. And then the pressure gets on them, and it's like, <laughs> where'd that come from? And you find out. I thought it's the grace and the love and, and what happened to all the mercy and, and Jesus and all this other stuff you're supposed to have. And under pressure, you <laughs> You manifested. Oh, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. So realize that rough times are not going to last. When you have a problem, your entire outlook is colored by the present. You, that's all you see. You become narrow thinking. Many times it's not the size of the problem, but the length of it that weighs us down. It keeps going and going. And I'm going to tell you, I understand that. I've seen people go through life and, and it's like the trial never ends. But one day I've got to believe it's, got, it's going to end. It's got to. You've got to know that it's going to pass. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not lose heart. Heart is courage in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we faint not. So you got to believe for the best and prepare for the... Yeah, y'all know the rest of the words there. Too many times our troubles are a result of our own planning. We plan poor. And we weren't ready for what was fixing to come down the pike. Never make a major decision when you're down. I say this to myself. I got to say it to you. I want you to catch it and get it inside your spirit. Never make a major decision when you're down. Amen. You, you, because I've done it. I've made major decisions when I was depressed, when, when I felt. And when, in making those decisions, it cost me. It cost so much out of my life. Amen. I remember my, my first real car wreck was made under a major decision. Amen. I, I tried to think I could push that car into that spot. Nay, I say unto thee. Oh. It didn't work. 
Amen. I was, I was up in the St. Louis area, just preached a youth camp in, in, uh, in Mountain Home, Missouri. And I was so excited. And I tried to come off a ramp and I, I saw a, car, a, v, a truck coming. I thought, I can make it. Nah, I, I pushed it. It was too much pressure. I even had my Rottweiler in the car with me, man. And I remember the, the wreck. And it, it, it brought humility in my life. And it reminded me, don't make, and yet in life, I still have made major pressures, made your decisions under pressure. Because some people will put pressure on you to make a decision. Right. And if you can back away and say, excuse me, let me have a little time here before I make this decision. Let me, let me get the pressure off of me and decide, uh, let me look at the, the, the ramifications of what I'm fixing to do here and how it may affect my life and others before I do it. So do you have all the facts to gather to make a proper decision? Another great thing, consider the source of the information. Who gave you that information? Right. Amen. If I get it from a sand ballad or a Tobiah, and I'm talking about Nehemiah right now, and I just went way over some of your heads, amen. But understand this, you know, i got to consider the information, amen, and who brought it to me. So why be thankful? Because ingratitude affects God. God didn't say just, you know, if you're thankful or not thankful, I'm cool with it. Listen, parents, grandparents, guardians, when you do for those around you, who can't do for themselves, and they are not thankful, <sighs> don't tell me it don't affect you. <laughs> a lot of things we do, all we want is a little bit of appreciation. Amen, Amen. a little thank you. A little, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I'd have made this without you. See, Psalm 106 tells us, then they believed his promises. Who they sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his counsel. This is the children of Israel, the 40 years in the desert, amen, and they forgot. And so David, and I love this, that, that here this happened uh, probably 1,800 years before David showed up, but he remembered the history of the children of Israel. Then David says, you know what? I remember what they did, and he wrote it down. And here we are in, in 2023, and we're telling everybody else, let me tell you what David talked about when David talked about what Moses went through when he says, but they soon forgot what they had done and did not wait for his counsel. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wasteland, they put God to the test. You remember, they didn't get in the water. I don't want water. We need water. And then Moses spoke to the rock, got water. And later on, they needed water. Moses got mad at them, and his attitude was exposed, and he struck the rock. And when he did, God said, boy, you messed up there. See, the rock was Christ. It was Jesus in the Old Testament, amen, where we get the, he said, out of your belly will flow rivers of water. We realize that now. They didn't pick up on it. They didn't, why? Because they didn't wait for his counsel. They weren't listening to him. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease upon them. I'll give you what you want, but it's going to cost you. The issue there was they forgot. Everybody say they forgot. <laughs> memory is, God gave you memory for a reason. So you could realize, reflect, go back on the goodness of God in the land of the living. Amen. Remind yourself of the goodness of God. Romans 121, for although, now we're in the New Testament, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This, this was a group of people that we even see today. They have forgotten who God is. And that's why when I hear about evolution, when I hear about people doing things their own way, I realize they have forgotten God. Amen. And that's what he said here. They didn't give God thanks. In Gratitude affects God. It affects us. Philippians 2.12. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Just try that for one day. Look at your, write it down. Put it in front of yourself. Put it on your mirror of your vehicle while you're driving on Interstate 10. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Amen. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it in the mirror at your house. Do everything without arguing and complaining. This is one of the, I wrote this this week and I realized this is a hard thing to do because you catch yourself. You catch yourself doing it and you got to remind, stop that. See, it's easy for me to catch my son-in-law complaining. <laughs> it's easy for you to catch somebody else complaining. But to catch yourself and to be honest with yourself, now that's a horse of a different color. Mm -hmm. So that you may become blameless and pure 
Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out or hold on to the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. In other words, I've talked to you, I've preached to you, I've shared with you. Now I want you to go through life without arguing and complaining. <sighs> That's what Paul is saying. Amen. Can we do that? Now complaining has the power to blind us from everything good and positive. When I'm complaining, I don't see the good. I don't see the positive. Amen. When I see, you know, some of us, we only see good and positive when gasoline prices go down. And many of you are still comparing it to the 1970s. Amen. <laughs> I, I talk about it all the time. You know, people talk about, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's minimum wage now? $20 in California. Uh, seven bucks, eight bucks here. Something like that. Minimum wage when I started working was buck twenty-five, and sometimes I bow up and say, "I remember making a dollar twenty-five cents an hour." They, yeah, but it ain't nineteen seventy-nine no more, Pastor. Amen. But but you go back and that, that's how your memory works. Amen. So you got to remember it has the power to blind us. It has the power to turn us sour and indifferent, to cloud our claim to be a Christian. You, you say you're a believer in Christ, and yet you got a sour puss face. You look like you've been sucking on persimmons. Green persimmons. Some of you don't even know what a persimmon is. God love you. Hey, man, I'm so glad this ain't a city church. Y'all do remember here in Crosby what persimmons are, don't you? We had a persimmon tree down in front of us. And, man, I love persimmons. And I tried to get to them before the yellow jackets did. Because them, them yellow jackets will fly around them sweet persimmons. Boy, they, try, they sting. But, man, somewhere between green and, and orange. If I could get, but if you ever got one that's a little on the, it'll get your teeth. You can't even open your mouth after you bite that thing. Amen. And some people, they that way in life. They just, they're so ungrateful. They just, they just, they just, they just gritting their teeth all the time. When you're ungrateful, it has the power to turn yours and other people's life into hell. Ungratefulness. I fear there are thousands who call themselves Christians who are not thankful. And yet, they never thought themselves very guilty on that account. They just think, I'm saved, but they're not thankful. Thankfulness. To see, the problem we have is first, we receive from God's hand daily blessings without ever giving thought as to where they came from. Your air you'll breathe, the job you got, the family you have, everything, your, your clothes that you're wearing, everything you got, you've got to remind yourself came from the hand of God. Oh, I work for it. God gave you the ability to work. Amen. He gave you the, the opportunity to do what you're doing. His mercies were new every morning. Life and breath, health and friends, food and clothing, the kindness of others, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a career or a job to go and make money to meet our needs. All of it comes every day as if, as it is, as if we run to the back door and we open it up and the blessings just come flowing in. It didn't happen that way. We receive all that God has given us, but sometimes we don't acknowledge the giver. Hmm. We get cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> this hardens up. Second, we grumble about what we don't have. <laughs> you know, I see. Well, comparisonitis or comparison. Comparisonitis is a disease. Uh, comparison demoralizes. To compare yourself all the time, it, it, it gets you in so much trouble. If it's manna, we wish we had quail. That's, that's the children of Israel. If it was cereal, we complain that we want eggs. If it's money, if it's a dollar, we want five dollars. Uh, amen. A, a thousand dollars. If, if we don't have cancer, we complain about our arthritis. If we, we have a car, we wish we had a truck. We dream of a better job. Amen. That we could do so much better. Amen. Compl Plain and one supposes goes back to Adam and Eve when he complained to Eve that the fig leaf made him itch. It's okay. Declare his works. I got to start closing. Psalm 107. He sent his word and healed them. You want a good psalm just to read? There are four P's in the book of Psalm 107. I don't have time to preach it to you. But there, there are plagues and pilgrims and pestilence. and You'll read it. But in this one part, in verse 20, he sent his word and healed them. There was a centurion that told Jesus, he said, if you'll just send your word, my, my daughter, I think it was his daughter, uh, will be healed. My her servant, his servant, his servant was sick. Amen. And he said, if you'll send your word, he'll be healed. And Jesus talked about his faith. 
There are times that I cannot travel 800 miles to my grandkids. I send the word. When you're praying for people, send the word. God, I send the word. I dispatch angels from heaven. Amen. Heal them, deliver them, and their destructions. They're in a mess right now, but I ask you to do it. And then he says, oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. That man would give God thanks. Amen. For the goodness of God. And then it, it walks a little bit further and it says, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. It's easy to give God thanks when things are going good. But can you give God a shout? Can you give God a thanks when things aren't going well? That's called a sacrifice. Amen. When, when I don't feel like it, I'm going to do it. When I, when, it, when I hurt inside, God, I'm going to do it. When the tears are flowing down my face and I don't understand why the emotions are there, I'm just going to give you thanks. I'm going to thank you for the life you've given me. I'm going to thank you for the life that's in me. I'm going to thank you for the ability to move and, and have movement. I want to thank you for a voice that I still have a voice in this world. And I have a voice in the lives of other people. To give God that thanks. Have you ever given a gift and never received a thank you for it? Yes, you have. Have you ever had the misfortune to have to hang around an ungrate? An ungrate. The word even sounds friction. Ungrate. <laughs> Every time you're around them, it's like. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You ever took the, the cheese? And <laughs> it's like being around them. It's like, oh, God, here they come. <laughs> you hear them coming. Oh. God help me. It, it, you're, you're stuck with them because they're in family. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look around. <laughs> he healed them. He delivered them. He blessed them. Amen. We've got to express our thanks and thanksgiving. Amen. So I'll close out of Psalm 116. Again, I'll go back to the King David, who with this tremendous amount of wealth now ascended to the throne He's walked through the test of the sheep. He took care of a lion, a bear. He took out a Goliath. He took out Philistines. He hid from a man he called father. That would have been Saul. He almost got ran through with spears at least twice. Amen. Here's a man that passed test after test after test. And now he's ascended. And there in Psalm 16, he gets to a place in his life where he sits back and he thought to himself, what can I give back to God for the blessing he's poured out on me? What can I do? I pray that this week that there will be reflection in your life and you'll say, what can I give back to God for the blessings that he's done in my life? I'll lift high the cup of salvation. I'll remind myself, you know, it was David, David talked about this cup. In Psalm 23, he says, my cup overflows. Amen. He was a man who had a, a cup bearer as a king that brought the cup in and, and poured the drink for him. Amen. I'm sure at times he saw the wine overflow the cup. The joy just overflowed. I've often said in life, I've looked at it and realized my cup won't hold the blessings of God in my life. Amen. There's something about it. So he said, I'll lift high the cup of salvation. A toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'll do. Did you know Scripture says don't make a vow before God unless you plan on fulfilling it? To be in awe of God out of the book of Ecclesiastes, to be in awe of God. It's better not to have made a vow than to make a vow and break it. Think about why you said what you said. And I'll do it together with His people. When they arrive at the gates of death, God welcomes those who love him. Another scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of his saints. When we pass from this life, it's precious to the Father. It does something for him. Amen. In other words, we're sad. Many people blame God. We're mad at God. We're upset. But you forgot he's not just God. He's Father. And as a father, 
He looks for the opportunity, amen, to give you this life on this earth, to be precious to you, amen, to look after you, to provide for you. But then there comes a day that he brings you home. He's not a grandfather. He gave you that blessing as a grandmother and a grandfather, but not him. And he invites his children to come back to him. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of his saints. When they arrive at the gates of death, God welcomes those who love him. Oh, God, here I am, your servant, your faithful servant. Set me free for your service. I'm ready to offer the thanksgiving sacrifice and pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'd do, and I'll do it in company with his people in the place of worship in God's house in Jerusalem, God's city. Hallelujah. God's house. Again, I go back to the book of Psalm. I think it's verse uh, chapter 24. I'll be a, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. <sighs> David would bring these things out, and then you'd see them repeated again in the New Testament. Amen. Over when Jesus said in John 14, I go away and prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also in my Father's house. I'm glad we have this figurative. I don't know. Is it going to be a, you know, a, when you think of a house, you think of a roof. When you think of a roof, you think of shelter. I don't, I've never read where it's going to rain in heaven. We may get a house without a roof in heaven. Hello. You know, I, you got to think deeper and think. I'm not trying to skew any theology. I'm just trying to help you understand that heaven's going to be an amazing place. But the best I can come up with down here on earth is this is going to be a house. And he's going to be a father. We're going to be sons and daughters. And, and I'm going to sacrifice. And I'm going to do with the things that he's asked me to do. But the thing I'm really going to do is tell you thank you. Thank you for the life you've given me. Thank you for the loves you've given me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So I proclaim in this house that we will stay a people of thanks. That we will be a thankful people. An appreciative people. That no matter what we've gone through, we're going to be thankful. No matter where we've been, we're going to be thankful. No matter what we've done, we're not doing that today. Amen. That no matter what we've missed, we're not missing that today. I love, and I'll close with this last verse, Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, in everything, in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you give thanks. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your mercies. I thank you that this week, not just this week, but every week of the year, we remind ourselves to give thanks to you. I say again, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody.